a lot of times when people use the term millennial, it always has sort of a negative connotation to it. I'm genuinely curious to see how people see us millennials talk about business. What do I think about the millennial investor? Uh, I myself am not an investor, but maybe if someone looked at it and thought, oh, it's about millennials who invest their time in discovering new trends and things that are viable, I think that works. I call this home, I love so many things about it, from safety to accessibility, how green it is to how clean it is. But the world has changed as a result of how we have misused certain things with our carbon footprint through energy, with over farming, over consumption. We're going so fast down that line, what's gonna happen 20, 30 years from now? Climate change is a real problem. It's very relevant to where we are today, so of course things that are most relevant, there definitely will be opportunity. This is a pretty big space, actually. It is. It is um, rather confusing as well. How long did it take for you to kind of get your bearings coming into this place. I think a few weeks, a couple of weeks at least. Okay. Because uh, we have access to all the different equipments here. So yeah. we're not confined to our laboratory benches. We're able to move around to see which equipment suits us the best for our application. I feel like I'm back in like chem lab in secondary <laughs> three. <laughs> which kind of gives me the creeps because I did really badly. <laughs> Here is our lab bench. This is Hui Yu, one of our research scientists. She Hi. is preparing the process for fermentation. This is that medical room. What we are looking at is the vitamin K2. We use LCMS to detect the nutrients and also anti nutrients that we cannot only see by the HPLC. So, LCMS is the connection between the HPLC and the mass fat. So, that's what we use to analyze and also quantitate the nutrients and anti-nutrients. Okay, a bit complicated. <laughs> Sorry to say I did not understand after what you were saying, but that's okay. If you understood <laughs> that, we have to hire you. <laughs> Maybe the, the layman's version in your, in, in your term is... Um, mm. This is like a double confirmation step to really assure and to ensure that we are getting the right stuff that we need and not just, you know, um, jumping the gun to say that you know, we have gotten the things that we want. Doing food is a very sacred um, industry where you really need to have um, a good integrity of data and this is what we are doing here. Essentially what you're trying to do is get us to be able to absorb nutrients from food better, quicker. Yeah. Uh, how did that come about from an idea perspective? I'm business trained. I had the honour and the privilege to work with different food companies. Um, from there, I observed that there are a lot of inefficiencies within the food supply system. So when we look at efficiency and sustainability, absorption naturally comes to mind because uh, people don't really know that what you eat is not equivalent to what they absorb. But if I could just get you to absorb just 50% more of what you are currently eating, um, we don't need that much food to feed the world. We just, because it doesn't translate into health anyways. So we look at it from the point of view of nutrition. We liberate the nutrients for your body to be able to absorb.
it sounds to me like a no-brainer from an investment sort of point of view mm. where people are saying, okay, this sounds like a, a, a great thing yep. to put our money in. Then what are the challenges? What makes them hesitant to right. kind of invest? From the investor point of view, it is always um, risky. You know, a business person coming out to do science, that is a bit unconventional. And also the notion of nutrient absorption and nutrient deficiencies is still very much premature or even nascent at this very, very point of time. Even when we talk to food manufacturers at the very beginning, the chief uh, technical officer would always tell us that I didn't even know that there was this presence of anti-nutrients that are blocking the absorption of my ingredients and all. People are familiar with, you know, just fortifying. So if this item doesn't have enough iron, I will just put in the chemical synthesized iron. If this item doesn't have the vitamin C, I'll just put in more chemical vitamin C. So for investors, um, at their point of view, if no one is really ramping up and talking a lot about it, then perhaps it's not a problem um, right. that is so urgently needs to be solved. This is the part where we make the invisible food technology visible okay. in terms of a food product. Other than B2B, we are also going to B2C because it is something that we can control. We can really present something that is void of additives, emulsifiers, preservatives or whatsoever. Putting in together a product that is complete protein, it delivers um, nine essential amino acids in just one piece of um, a tofu like product, but it is non soy, it is gluten free, um, it contains just three plant ingredients and salt. That's it. So, but this is just a beta version. Okay. Uh, wanted to try, maybe give sure. us some comments. I feel like everything you've said is kind of a checklist of people who have their like <laughs> nine amino acids, gluten free, like they're take, <laughs> taking the check off the box, especially for those without soy. But let's let's go for it, Sarah. I'm both excited and nervous at the same time. Right. Is that how I should feel? <laughs> is that how it is? I think you should have a whiff first. Uh, Sarah okay. has painstakingly prepared. It actually smells good. Right. But I know, yeah. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. I'm gonna eat it with me. I think so. Cheers. 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 Okay. Hmm. Okay. You like it? No. Yeah. Like to be honest. To be honest, okay. Like I'm not gonna crave it in the middle of the night. Mm. But if you add some like sweet and sour sauce mm -hmm. and some like chili, mm. I could eat this no problem. You address both the B two B and the B two C. Mm. And moving forward, how do you make that a profitable and sustainable business? Well, I think commercialization is the key. It cannot just stay in the laboratory forever because all you have is just operating costs mm. and expenses. So for us, um, the quicker we go to market, the quicker we commercialize the technology, the products that we make in the laboratory, um, the faster we can get to a positive revenue company. Because right now we're still pre-revenue, but um, we're working towards um, commercialization. And by next quarter, we're expected to send some samples and really you know, go out to the market. Sustainability right now is a trend. How would you describe the impact that investors can start making into the space? We are specialized in, in food and feed technology. The food industry, the way it has been built over the last 50 years, it has a lot of negative impact on the environment. Today, the urgency is to resolve some of their core issues in the process, in the packaging, in the distribution. It's an enormous endeavor, potentially very profitable, fair amount of risk, but I think in terms of impact, that will be massive. You said potentially very profitable. Yes. A lot of people see green initiatives mm -hmm. not being something that's very lucrative. Uh, how true is that? I think the impact dimension and the the profitability dimension basically are, are completely uh, uh, intertwined. We're looking at the food system and the feed system, something that is consumed and, and shared by pretty much all humankind. So it has, has a large impact, but because it's a very wild and, and, and scalable uh, um, solution, that in itself could be very profitable. Are there any companies in Singapore that you've seen that have some great ideas? Yeah. 
when we started, you know, four or five years ago, there was not much going on in Singapore in, uh, in this respect. And, and that has changed dramatically over the last two, three years. Uh, our pipeline of Singapore companies have grown up, you know, uh, fairly, very strongly. Obviously, the help from the government is helping. But I think more than that, I think there is people understand that the opportunity is just enormous. What do you look for when you look at the company? The only caveat for us is that this company needs to address a problem and, and provide a solution that is relevant for the region. Because if it's relevant, then it's scalable. The biggest mistake is to address something that we think are interesting, but peripheral or marginal uh, for the industry at this point of time. Food is not on its own. It's part of a much bigger societal structure. And you have to make sure that you don't just displace one problem with another problem. Because if the consequences of that particular uh, innovation is to put millions of farmers out of job, I'm not sure the, the, the world is a better place. Welcome to Bollywood Veggies. I hear they've got some jackfruit, uh, so we're gonna try and find some. We look for ingredients that you know have a great sourcing story down to the farmer level. And jackfruit is a really incredible crop in that it's really friendly for smallholder farmers especially to grow. But when you harvest it in its unripe form and you cook it, it takes on this very meat-like texture. And was that the first thing that came to mind when you were looking for alternative meat sources? Jackfruit kind of no, nailed it from it the was, beginning? No, well... We didn't discover jackfruit. You know, jackfruit has been yeah. used in Indonesia, to India, all over the region in this kind of format for a long time. You know, we commonly consume less than 150 out of 30,000 edible plant species in the world. So there's a lot of room to expand what we eat. I think something about 12 crops make up 75% of what most of us eat on a daily basis. One of the interesting things about jackfruit is that we don't really need to plant more of it. Pretty much anywhere in a tropical setting where you'll see a lot of other things growing, jackfruit will just pop up and grow. It requires very little water. You don't need to add fertilizers or pesticides. It's one of the highest yielding crops in the world. And speak of the devil. Yeah, right here, the jackfruit. <laughs> Looking pretty majestic, if I may say so exactly. myself. Exactly. These are probably too mature for what we'd be using. We tend to use it in the unripe forms. The okay. sugars haven't formed. This one looks like it might be something we would use. It looks a bit smaller. The See, tiny one. Give that a few weeks or a month, and that'd probably be right about where we would want it to cook. From a business perspective, focusing on such a natural product, is that then harder to get investment for because it's just so readily available? We look for ingredients that are abundantly available and that's part of the reason we choose jackfruit. But jackfruit is not an easy thing to work with. I mean, to get it from what we saw in the tree and what we have here today to an end form that is really usable in the kitchen, right. there's a lot that goes on in the middle. And that's where a lot of our proprietary technology is focused. Plant-based is a pretty hot space right now. Right. There's so much opportunity in the Asia Pacific region. People will want more whole plant options. They want more convenience focused products that still have a health profile. And, and that does seem to resonate with investors. Here we have Chef Hello. Hello. Hey, hi. That smells good in here. What we've done here is we've just chopped up some carrots, some uh, scallions, radish, and jackfruit. And you can see that it almost mimics like any meat mince. I'm going to fold one um, and show you. While I would love to taste what you have to do, why, why the need to have recipes that your guys are trying out instead of going straight to the chefs and saying, hey, we have the jackfruit, do as you wish? 
it kind of gives us the comfort level that we are hundred percent sure as to like how we can use it to uh, exploit certain qualities that you want for that particular dish, right? It's always important that you've done enough R and D. Ta-da! Now you eat the hot one. I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> You would fool me. If I didn't know this was rack food, I would have no idea, honestly. Fantastic. Mm. You think to be able to scale and grow the business, you have to be a little bit more widespread, more in Southeast Asia, mm. Europe, and beyond. Singapore is a great test and launch market for us. There's such a good startup ecosystem, and because it is a hub for ag tech and food tech in the region, people are definitely passionate about food here. People are also open to trying new things. So it's a great way to test with different consumer segments and see what works and what doesn't and be ready to go into a bigger market. I think he's probably at the first step right now. Jackfruit as a singular object that you provide is probably a little bit too restrictive or limited. In this day and age when uh, there's a lot of tech elements involved, it might pale in comparison. But using something that's existing in abundance also means that potentially your cost is lower. That may be more attractive from an investment standpoint. Compared to trying to bank on something that's new or a new technology that hasn't been tested, a country who hasn't been around for a very long time, right? 54 years. Our European or American counterparts are a little bit more ahead in terms of the education and the awareness about sustainability. Everybody starts somewhere and we can see there's definitely a lot of efforts being made. The government's aiming to have us produce 30% on our own by 2030. They talked about solar energy accounting for 4% of all energy being produced by 2030 as well. They have this $100 billion fund to prevent the disastrous effects from climate change. The government is always looking at new initiatives. And of course, when there's the carrot, people want to come get a piece of that pie as well. Ryan? Inesh. Hello. Well, not the farms I'm used to visiting, to be yeah. honest. Urban environment is quite unusual, isn't it? It is. Especially in Singapore. What we're trying to do here is establish symbiotic agroecologies. What that means is that we're trying to make food work for each other. So, for example, when we have aquaponics, my fish produce fertilizer and then they feed the plants the fertilizer. At the same time, the plants filter the water for the fish. We don't need to pay for fertilizer for our plants if the life count ratios are properly managed. That means that there's a real saving. In most commercial farms, fertilizer and chemical costs can be about 17% of agriculture costs, your overall pecs. If you can eliminate that, your profit margins just jump a big deal. At the same time, if you don't need to pay for a filtration system, quite a lot of your capital costs just go down. I have insects there too. It's a three-way system. So these are my black soldier flies. I'm going to put one of these. Okay. Let me pick out a few for you. Oh, look at that. So these I'm trying were... Trying to get to the end. Don't eat it, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't planning on it. These little guys feed off this. Waste chicken feed. We can use food waste from humans as well. These guys eat anything. But what does that give us? High quality protein feed. Protein for those little fishes. So when we say sustainability, it's not some hippie dippy trying to save the forest or everything. Even though we are trying to do that, it's about commercial value as well. But this is a POC. It's not big enough, it's not grand enough, it's not capturing the full value of what symbiotic agroecology combined with agritech can possibly achieve. You're sort of in the midst of trying to get people on board to kind of buy into the idea. What are some of their reservations initially, despite uh, what you tell them? The problem with this idea, it is pioneering. People think that's lunacy. It's like the people who said, oh, computers will never take off. And we have a computer in every home now. 
what happens if, let's say, sustainable symbiotic agroecologies is the next computer for agriculture? We'll never know. How is it getting investors to their vision? Can you give me 10x in five years? That's what they're looking for. Now, for such a small startup, um, you can't see that 10x being a strong probability. If it doesn't have to be a point of 10x, 5x, 3x, whatever that may be, you make some sort of profit, but you make a bigger impact, would that be okay with you? Yeah, the social enterprise model is something that we've considered as well, but social enterprises don't scale fast. It's a bit hard because you're spending more, most of your cash uh, trying to do good work. And the way I see it is just the more profit we make, the more social good we can do. This is the chicken feed waste that I was telling you about. It's dry, so we just need to moisten it now. Just a tap here. You ready? Yep. I feel like I'm gonna about to bake something. Yeah. Start mixing it around. Testing Almost it a little well. bit therapeutic. Probably about two or three more cups. Those guys are hungry. They can finish five kg of waste a day. Five kg of waste a day? Yep. When they start, they are the size between my nails. Uh. The eggs are absolutely tiny. Oh, you feed them well, so. Yeah, yeah I feed them very well. <laughs> I mean, they're eating rubbish, but they don't know that. <laughs> What we want to do is evenly spread it out. So, um, Hunger Games begin. <laughs> do you think then Singapore will ever get to a place where we can be co competing with international markets? No, it's not viable. I, Because we are so land constrained and the moment that you have to use LED lights as a pseudo light source to compact the food growing into a dense urban environment, you are swapping what is free, sunlight, for cost. You are using high-tech systems that demand high-tech resources, energy, space, infrastructure, and all those add up, which is why people have to pay exorbitant amounts for locally grown produce that is grown some sort of hydroponically or something like that. It does come at a premium. So a lot of agri-tech companies set up their company in Singapore, and then they expand overseas. Sustainability is a long-term business. It's not about quick wins. So you need to be driven by what impacts the business can make. You're going to be driven by social responsibility because it's not just environmental impact. I think the social impact is important as well. Okay, lots of vegetables on that sushi. This one, kale, his produce. This one also, the, I just took from there. Say so any garnish, Produce him. So the, the red leaf hibiscus, the okinawa and spinach, uh, cosmo flowers, uh, butterfly pea, and coral vine as well. Try the dish. Okay. I'll let you try the, the okinawa spinach. It's good. Today we grow about 30 to 40 different types of, of things uh, that we supply to about 70 restaurants on a weekly wow. basis. We have things like Okinawan spinach, um, purslane. So what we tend to work along is um, higher value type produce. Because space is small, we need things to grow fast and can harvest quickly so okay. that we free up the space to then grow more, right? Yes, higher value, so if you turn that around faster, it makes more business sense, I would say. It does, and over the last um, five to 10 years, um, the, the trend has been changing. A lot of chefs are really interested in using things like uh, microgreens, things that are small but punchy, right. that has a lot of flavour, right. that then aesthetically also looks good when they Everyone bake. likes a good Instagram photo of their food before eating, so I think that always helps. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's uh, riding on those trends and then uh, innovating in how we grow. Uh, there is no uh, doubt that it's one of the toughest industry. If you don't have skill, it is very hard to, um, to, to make it very viable for the long term.
you've obviously had a lot of success with what you've done right now. Could you talk a little bit maybe about your business model and how you're able to make money and sustain what you do? We are a social enterprise and we base a lot of our uh, business values on the impact that we make how many jobs that we are providing to the beneficiaries within the community, how much food waste are we dealing with on a weekly basis by turning them into organic fertilizer on our farm. How many people have come to the farm and been engaged uh, through programs. We cannot promise a 30% margin on return uh, because we're not conventional business, but it is financially viable um, and maybe a 5-10% margin. So we, we tend not to talk to um, venture capitalists and other financiers uh, in the high margin game. There's a lot of talk into technology, helping to transform businesses. Do you see how technology can also change and maybe help you make it more profitable? We do know that labour is one of the limiting factors in the agriculture industry. But sometimes we need to look broader in terms of solutions. So instead of putting an AI robot that will then do all the seeding and harvesting work, uh, perhaps we can look at uh, adults with autism who can perform repetitive tasks. So I think it's being innovative in that social business model allow us to then address multiple impact points rather than just uh, in business. Bjorn is a great example. And there has to be a place in the capital market for sustainable businesses. You just have to line up the whole ethics idea with the business for it to go hand in hand. Historically, we've seen businesses being able to benefit from inclusivity or diversity and an idea like sustainability is, uh, is the same thing. It's about having those values uh, and putting it front and centre and shape your company around those things. Hey Ted! Hey, good to see you. Good to see you. No better week than Singapore Energy Week to definitely, me. Definitely, definitely. Let's go talk some energy. Let's talk yeah, some energy. Yeah, yeah. What led you down that sustainability path end up where you are today? I studied power system and renewable energy in, in university. So I was looking at different area where you know you can really make an impact with your work. Mm. Right, we have internet, we have all these digital technology on the consumer side, but from the industrial sector, energy sector, it's almost untouched. Right. Right. So, so that's where I decided that's, that's going to be the next way for digitization. So tell me a little bit about the technology that you developed. Our focus is how can we help companies, larger companies, manage their energy better using data analytics. So there's a few aspects of it. We first developed the sensor aspect. So instead of manually go check every component in the big buildings, um, you now deploy sensors. Once the sensor is there, every data will be wirelessly collected to a centralized cloud system. And from that, you know, you have recommendations telling them what other things you can do better that will help you improve efficiencies. Let me quickly show you. Sure. So there's different equipment, etc. They all have their own domain knowledge. What right. we have done is that for any type of equipment, if you just key in the basic information, you right away process and let you know what are the things you need to be careful about in a matter of just seconds or seconds minutes. Seconds or minutes. Right. And then this is one equipment we're talking about. You can have um, tens or even hundreds of it if you look at it as a group. Sounds like cost savings is yeah, going to yeah, be huge. Yeah. How easy or difficult has it been for you then introducing this technology to people? When, when we first started it in 2013, people don't care about energy, right? They don't want to incur any additional costs on infrastructure, data collection, and, and so on. The barriers of entry into the energy sector is extremely high because everything is compliant. I always talked about that if this company, if Evercom was not started in Singapore, mm -hmm. we couldn't have done what we have done. 
I got lucky in the sense that in NTU, there's an energy research institute which do all the national level research. Right away, we get connected to that and learn what we need to learn. And then when we start to, to, to go to the industry, when we start to work in the industrial side, um, Singapore government right away help us get connected to GE, General Electric. Right. right, And that's where we learn all the energy domain stuff. When we start to go to the commercial side, Singapore Tourism Board step in to help. So these are all the help that is there to help reduce the barriers of a, of a traditional industry like energy sector. And we don't see that in most of the country around the world. Thank you. Let me introduce you to Darren, who's the chief engineer here. Hi, Darren. Nice to see Hi. you. Nice to see you. Thank you, you for having you. us. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah. we work very closely with him to develop the whole system, pilot everything. So definitely he's the brain that we picked to okay. develop the algorithm. So has it been really beneficial for you guys yeah, since you've employed uh, the technology? Very beneficial to our chiller plant uh, and our technician. Shall we go take a look? Yes, please. Let's go. Well, Ted, one of the things you said is that you picked his brain a lot to help to modify the system to make it work specifically for them. What were some of the things that he kind of contributed to the project? Yeah, so when we design the machine learning algorithms, we don't know how it will function in the hotel operations. So we get a lot of pieces of feedback to tell us what recommendation actually makes sense and what doesn't, right? So over the times, the machine can get more and more accurate and that's where his feedback and knowledge becomes very important to us. Got it. Yes, but once we get it once, it will work throughout this. Okay, here we are. Okay, oh, let's go. Wow, so this is where oh. everything is sort of stored. So this is the chiller. We have a epoch called install sensor. This one is a temperature sensor. This is a flow meter. Yeah, so the data will transmit to here. So you can see the reading here. What are some of the benefits that you were able to see from implementing the system uh, in the chiller room? The digitization is good for the offline uh, monitoring. And also we know where is the efficiency and uh, whenever we want to do the chiller plant upgrading, so we can use this real-time data to satisfy our capex. Moving from you know, manufacturing and now more commercial building, what are some of the other plans that you have? I think collaboration is key moving forward. Okay. Right now, we're headquartered in Singapore, but we have offices in Thailand, uh, Malaysia, Taiwan, Myanmar, um, and then we're setting up in Israel and Europe next year. And the reason that we set up that way is actually we don't have a choice. What we learn over the years is every country has their expertise. If I want a security expert, Israel is the place to go. Right? If I want a hardware expert, Taiwan, China is the place to go. I just cannot hire that kind of caliber with the cost here. Okay. And that's why we need to really leverage on different countries' expertise. To survive in a city that's expensive as this, I think it's really difficult because it's such a small city, it's such a small market. While you can make an impact, there is also a ceiling. So I think being uh, you know, viable in the long term and scalable, you need to have ambition beyond Singapore. Kind of get out there and build the business to be bigger than you think it could be. Sustainability is such a hot-button topic at the moment. How does the finance industry kind of play a part in all of this? I think what we must do is focus on what are the big issues that we're facing in Southeast Asia or in Asia, and what can we do as a bank. And obviously, the primary thing we can do is through our lending portfolio, right? Who do we lend to, who do we choose not to lend to? We screen all companies through a social and environmental lens. So to answer your question about what can finance do, bank can incentivize you. What are some incentives then does the bank provide to companies who you know make those green choices, those sustainable choices? On the product side, you may have heard of ideas such as green bonds, green loans, and ESG link loans. These are effectively financing vehicles that we can offer to either listed or unlisted companies or both. Thank <laughs> you.
If we're talking about the green bonds and green loan, then they invite a conversation with investors who want to buy into green assets, and you have to provide the transparency to give them that information, so it forces a conversation and some, instills some rigor in you. We've yet to see the funding benefits really coming through of that. But the ESG-linked loans is an interesting evolution. So this is where the interest rate of your loan is actually directly correlated or pegged to your ESG performance, your environmental, social and governance performance. Here's a real incentive, right? Because if you improve in your scores, you will actually get a lower interest rate and vice versa if you don't do so well. The incentive that most companies start to talk about is the access to capital. As capital providers, whether it's lenders or, or financiers, equity financiers, if they start to have these requirements, if you want to get access to that pool of capital, which is rapidly growing, you better get your house in order. Yeah. How do you think the bank can further grow to promote this? Right now, all the stuff that we talked about was in the corporate space, right? Mm. There's a whole segment around the consumer side which is being under under thought of, if I can find a lack of a better word, right? So if you say, listen, I, I want to be part of this movement, but where do I put my money so I know they go into good use? You know, that, that is really a space that very few banks have grabbed. So you'll, I think you'll start to see more of these types of features like green deposits or retail investment products. Any sort of investment that's being made uh, in this industry, there has to be a level of connection or personal belief. Things that excite millennials would be sustainability for sure. People want to do good. And nowadays, there is a moral sort of commitment to sustainability. There clearly is a demand for it, sustainable investment. It's always nice to see like a real project in action. Hello. Hey, welcome. Thank you. This is definitely eco-friendly, I take it. Yes. <laughs> so we're off to Tulunas? Yes. How long is it going to take us? 90 minutes. All right, so we have plenty of time to, to catch up. depend on the location. So for this location here, for Telunas, a solar, diesel, battery hybrid, that's what makes sense. We choose the energy sources in such a way that the cost of energy at the end of the day is the lowest for that given site. Telunas is one of your earliest projects that you embarked on. How long does it take to deploy such a project? Once the contract is signed, um, it can take anything between four to six months. But majority of period is for bringing the material in. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, these places are quite remote, so logistics takes time. And then once everything is here, it can take anything between eight to 12 months to build it. How much cost can someone save? The savings comes from replacing diesel with renewable energy, right? So depending on the cost of the diesel at any particular place, the payback period is anything between four to six years. The lifetime of the system is 20 to 25 years. So after, say, six years, you're looking at getting pretty much free electricity because the projects are very remote and everybody's always worried about what if the system goes down. So we developed a remote monitoring and management system.
On the way here, we saw some villagers. Do you think this is something that can also impact them? You know, the vision of the company is empowerment through electrification. So we want to empower not only the businesses, but also the communities. We are already involved with our local partners in Philippines, in Myanmar. Indonesia is the largest market for community electrification. What we are waiting for, obviously, is for the streamlining of regulations, right? Because once you get involved into providing electricity to the community, the regulations come into play. That's what other players are waiting for. But once that's straightened, there will be a lot of microgrids popping up in communities all over Indonesia, Philippines, Myanmar, all these places. The renewable energy microgrids is the next big segment uh, for renewable energy. It's a multi-billion dollar market right here in Southeast Asia. Looks like I see something. Well, not something, actually a lot of things. Is this all the panels that you guys have to power the island? Most of the panels, there are a few on the rooftop, but this is 80%. Oh, wow. Actually, it's not too many considering the amount of exactly. energy. Exactly, yeah, creates. because we use very high efficiency, high power panels. Mm -hmm. So that reduces the number of panels you need. They're sitting here looking up. Whenever there is sunlight, even if it's diffused like, like today, mm -hmm. they will generate electricity and then it flows to this blue room, the inverters will convert them into AC. We also have battery system inside there. So store all the excess Exactly, once exactly, okay. because we have excess capacity here. So okay. whatever the excess generation that goes into the battery and we discharge the batteries at night. And this is how we can keep the genset off for 12, 15, sometimes 20 hours a day. Uh -huh. So this is where the power is stored. So what you see here, these are the lithium-ion batteries. On this wall, the yellow uh, boxes, these are battery inverters, bi-directional inverters. They convert the energy they convert from... They convert the energy from AC to DC, Got DC it. to AC. And on this side, the blue ones, they convert the PV-DC power into AC. Obviously, solar panels are not something that are very inexpensive for people to invest in at the moment. So for those who can't have that sort of upfront investment, do you guys help to connect them with anyone who can carry that load a little bit for them? Financing plays a critical role in renewable energy because a renewable energy projects, solar or wind or anything, they're generally very capital intensive. So considering this, we do provide financing to the customers who are eligible. So we have formed a partnership with a European fund. Is there a little bit of a risk on the people providing that? Because you're looking at 15, 20 years, what happens if resorts close down, things change? The risk is always there. That's why a, a very deep due diligence is conducted to make sure that such risks are mitigated. What was the immediate problem that you saw that you felt this needs addressing? Typically, you were used to build a, a large power plant or coal plant that require 500 million. Now you build smaller solar farm, wind farm that can be uh, 10, 20, 50, 100 million. Because these projects are smaller and because traditionally the finance system has not been used to finance smaller projects, these projects have really have a time to secure the investment to get built. We want to help the developers to make sure that they can find the money in order to build these uh, this power plants that are good for the environment. And we do that for an online platform, which is really unique. There is no other platform like that in, in Asia. And you even have the number of shares as well. Yeah, we see, uh, we, we try to show what is the investment opportunity proposed by the developer to the investor. So how much money do they need? What do they offer in exchange? Describe a bit the project.
But here you don't see the name of the developer, you don't know exactly the location, because we still want to protect the project. Right. So if the investor likes the project, he can ask the developer to give him further access to the project. What's the kind of ROI people can expect on oh, a yeah. project like that? The projects that we list on the platform typically have an IR between 10 and 15%. Okay. Uh, very attractive. Right now, there's so many different platforms or resources like for crowdfunding, for yes. example. Why would someone come to you in that sense? For example, a small wind farm is still a project that will require an investment of maybe five to 30 million US dollars. So the only people who are really capable to finance this project are um, institutional investors, people who uh, are mandated by other organizations to invest large amount of capital. Crowdfunding, it's a very nice idea. I would like to be able to associate all the society in this project, but in practice, it's, it's, uh, it's not really uh, actionable. Yeah, I like this one. This one is in India, it's on the roof space of a building. Sunset, beautiful building. You can sell the dream in this way much more effectively. <laughs> <laughs> It seems so simple in, in theory, right? Like you build a platform where people can meet to make a positive change. So I thought that was fantastic. Southeast Asia is a place where there's a lot of change that can be made. And there are also a lot of opportunities that will present itself as a result of that. Better ways to process or to eliminate food waste, plastic waste, how we can be cleaner in that whole manufacturing process. From a corporate level, there are so many things that we can do more responsibly. You know, maybe I'm sitting here being a little bit naive, but I always believe at the end of the day, the way businesses should look, what they want to achieve should be about adding value to people. And I think sustainability has that ability to make that large impact.